Welcome to New York Got Game. Welcome back to another edition of New York Got Game, where the NBA regular season is over. We are in playoff mode. The New York Knicks, they finished with 50 wins on the season, the first time since 2012-2013, that season, that they have reached the 50-win mark. The team will also be the number two seed in the East playoffs. Now, the Brooklyn Nets, they're not playoff bound. They finished their campaign 32-50, and 50. and last week, New York Post Nets beat writer Brian Lewis reported that general manager Sean Marks of the Nets will remain with the team. Brooklyn is looking for a new head coach, and according to Sham Sharania of The Athletic, former NBA championship coach Mike Budenholzer is a finalist for the Nets job. But enough talk about the non-playoff teams. We are in playoff mode here, and on this episode, we're going to preview the postseason for the New York Knicks with two special guests making their Third appearance on the show, Tim Kitzrow. Let the people know what the Knicks are doing. The Knicks are heating up. That's right. The Knicks are heating up. So here we are. We're in the NBA playoffs. It's playoff time. And the Knicks, they finished with the second best record in the East. However, they're not going to know who their opponent will be until after Wednesday's Eastern Conference 7-8 play-in tournament game. However, you know what time it is. We have to preview the potential playoff matchups here. And there was no better duo to preview the postseason with me other than the two men who previewed the season with me. They were also here in studio when the OG Ananobi trade went down. They are now the only three-time guest on New York Got Game. My guys here in studio, CP the franchise of Knicks Fan TV, Jonathan Macri of Knicks Film School. What's up, guys? How y'all feeling? Orange and blue skies, next. You're fantastic. <laughs> Orange and blue skies. The yeah. vibes are also good, yeah. J-Mac? Lots of cautious optimism in the air. Cautious optimism. <laughs> well, this is good because optimism was here when you guys came to preview the season. Yeah. yeah. There was even more optimism after the OG and an OB trade. Yeah. And we'll get into why the season's been up and down. But I'm assuming you said orange and blue skies. Optimism's still here for playoffs, right? No, absolutely. Right. It's at a fever pitch for playoffs right now, man. <laughs> All right, you guys are ready to go. You have the pulse of the fan base. You know what's going on. So we're going to get right into it for the fans. And we're going to start off with this question for both of you because the Knicks, they win 50 games. First 50-win season since 2012-2013. Mm. But, guys, you know this. This season had injuries, yeah. a lot of uncertainty surrounding the Knicks. One, but we saw the team overcome a lot of adversity. Yeah. So i got to ask you this. When you look at this 50-32 and 32 season, how do you put it in perspective? It was a phenomenal season. They lost an all-NBA, all-star caliber player in Julius Randle. 60% of your lineup since January they were missing. Mm. Two big trades, the OG Ananobi acquisition and bringing in Boyan Bogdanovich and Alec Burks, who were pretty ineffective just since they got here in February. But yet and still, they're the number two seed in the East. They have a legitimate MVP candidate in Jalen Brunson. I think a legitimate, most improved player candidate in Dante DiVincenzo. With both of those guys, two of the best contracts in the NBA. And so it just speaks to the organization, the culture that they've instilled, the discipline in terms of how they crafted this team. They didn't panic at the trade deadline. They still stuck to their game plan. And they put a competitive basketball team out there. Look at where their net rating is as compared mm -hmm. to their payroll. It's been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just did a great job. This time of year, in previous years, we would look at, okay, can they make the eighth seed? We've been hoping to get that eighth seed. Or can they get the lottery, right? The Maurice Endower games. But now, <laughs> this is legit. This is a legit Knicks team. And so it's, it's just been a great ride so it, far. It sounds to me like when I hear that from CP, CP almost doesn't know what to do with himself this where the trauma. Knicks are, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> from the tra traumatic experiences you had before. How do you put this in perspective, j Mac? How do you put it in perspective? No, I think CP did a great job kind of focusing on the on the micro of this season. I, I go a little bit more macro, uh, which is to say it's been less than five years since June 30th, 2019, when Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving decided, you know what, we want to come to New York, but we don't, we don't want to come to that franchise. We want to go to the new, cool, hip thing. And back at that time, I would argue – that the Knicks were as uh, maybe as much of an embarrassment as a franchise as any in the NBA, if not all of all of professional sports, because here was a major market team that, again, you had two superstars who wanted to come to your city and they said, no, we don't want to go there despite all of your history, despite the fact that you have two world championships, despite the fact that you've had a ton of great players come through your doors. We want to go over here. And then they had to own that, and how they owned it was they tried to make the best of it, and it was not a successful season. That brings in Leon Rose, it brings in Tom Thibodeau, mm -hmm. and it brings in Julius Randle, who I'm happy you mentioned Julius before, and then ultimately it brought in Jalen Brunson. 
And I think for me, if you look at the NBA historically, there is the moment that before you get your superstar, your MVP candidate, your, your guy that you believe in, and the moment after that. And I think for as much as everything changed when Leon came in, Tibbs came in, and all of that, I think the moment that Jalen Brunson came in here is when, for me, the perspective and the outlook for this organization truly, truly changed. And for them to have done all of that in a span of, again, less than five years, it, it really speaks to the people uh, running the show and the culture that they've instilled. Yeah, and that's the word I, that I keep hearing a lot from Knicks fans, right? And even other journalists, you know, I've talked to as well, too. It's, it's about culture, and the culture has been so strong with this team, and it gives them optimism, I think, for a lot of people going forward. J-Mac, I want to come back to you on this yeah. one, because when you look at this season, you look at the team's performance as they head into this playoffs, what are the team's strengths and weaknesses as they head into this postseason run? I'm going to combine those if I can, because I think one of the unique things about this team is that they're greatest strength is that they don't really have a weakness. So uh, traditionally entering into the NBA playoffs, you look at two things. You look at where does the team rank in offensive rating, where does the team rank in defensive rating. And there's usually only about three, four, maybe five teams that rank in the top ten in both entering the postseason. The Knicks are one of four teams, along with the Boston Celtics, the Denver Nuggets, and the Oklahoma City Thunder. Those three teams, I would argue, are probably the top three, you know, quote-unquote contenders in most people's eyes. Well, the Knicks are right there with those three in terms of being able to do it all on offense and being able to do it all on defense. You could look at them and say, well, they only have one shot creator, right? I mentioned Jalen Brunson already, which, okay, that, that's maybe an issue. We've seen them succeed for now months with Jalen Brunson as their only shot creator. And they have figured it out by revamping their offense. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But when you look at the infrastructure, the defensive infrastructure, where they always have 48 minutes of rim protection, where they have now on the offensive end added shooting to go with what Jalen Brunson is able to do. There's not really a target for if you're an opposing team, you're like, well, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and we're going to take New York out of their game. Because as long as Brunson keeps doing what he's doing, and he's been unguardable for now really a couple months, I don't really see how where the weak spot is for this, this version of this Knicks team. That, that See, this also adds to a lot of the optimism there. And what we're going to do is take off of that and talk a little bit about Jalen Brunson. I'm going to bring this one to you, CP, because you just heard J. Max say, as long as Brunson keeps doing what he's doing, cooking like he's been cooking, this team will be okay. Here's the thing. We've seen this guy carry the load a lot for this team. Two-part question here. Are you worried about fatigue with Jalen Brunson? And also then, who needs to step up? Which Nick player needs to step up to help Jalen Brunson through this playoff run? No, I'm not worried about fatigue with Brunson. This is the time for him to raise his game. This is what superstars do, and he's built for it in the brightest stage with the biggest city, the biggest market in the world. This is why Jalen Brunson has been our guy. And so mm. he looks forward to those moments. I think he wants redemption after that crucial loss against Miami in game six last yeah. year. And so he, he's certainly ready for it. Now, who needs to step up? I go in this order. Obviously, Brunson is your constant. I think Josh Hart is going to be vital for this team in multiple fronts. Number one, maintaining their rebounding edge, especially if they play play a big team like a Philadelphia, getting out in transition, helping this team get easy buckets because I do think they will find areas where they may struggle to get instant to get good offense and then also as a playmaker when Brunson when they put two on the ball against Jalen Brunson you saw great offense in Josh Hart cutting cutting to the middle where then he's able to get some high efficiency shots at the rim or kick it out to the wings where you may have a Dante DiVincenzo maybe a Dukes McBride or even an OG Ananobi to get those three so Josh Hart is going to be critical for this team and also He's going to need to knock down shots and step into those threes confidently. Mm -hmm. He can't duck shots in the playoffs because teams are going to not respect him as a shooter and just key in on Jalen Brunson. So he's got to be able to help them space the floor. Additionally, Boyan Bogdanovich, that's mm -hmm. my next mm -hmm. guy because off of the bench, they're going to need critical bench scoring. And he's going to be, outside of Brunson and Hart, their next best shot creator. So what is he going to do against second units? How will he handle defensively being a marked man? Because oh, yeah. he will be that guy when he's out there in those minutes. And so his ability to sustain defensively is also going to be key in, in this team surviving with this second unit. I love those two guys you mentioned because I think a lot of times when we look at playoff series, guys, we talk a lot about these stars. But we know that a lot of this stuff comes down to the role players and how they are going to be. And so seeing a Josh Hart who's been instrumental, like you said, also Boyan Bogdanovich, who's played well as of yeah. late, yeah. should be huge for the Knicks. This question is a topic, the next thing we're going to get to, there's been a lot of talk about this with the Knicks. 
and following Sunday and their season finale. Mm. A lot of talk about whether the Knicks should have wanted the second seed or maybe they should have tried to avoid it and not try to play the Heat or the Sixers, who we'll get to. For both of you guys, and we'll get to breaking down that, do you think the Knicks did the right thing by going for the second seed, not ducking the smoke, saying we're going to go for this? Did you like the move they made to go after the second seed, if you want to call it aggressively, on Sunday in the regular season finale. Well, we know who their head coach is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know, we know, what, we know, we know what he's about. Listen, right. there is no duck in the smoke where Tom Thibodeau is concerned. We are going pedal to the metal right. from one to eighty-two and, and beyond. He wants his guys ready for the postseason, and it's kind of like in football. You know, the Giants had those scenarios back in their heyday with Tom Coughlin, where it was like, should they rest guys before the wild card, or should they try to get some momentum and play straight through? Uh, I'm, I'm with the latter. Play, play your A game because at the end of the day, if the Knicks are going to be that team that that many of us hope they can be in this mm-hmm. playoff run, you're going to have to beat legitimate teams. And so I'd like to see them playing at their best, continue to game chemistry. Now they get a critical week off so they can get some much needed rest. But I- I'm with the philosophy. You're going to play who's ahead of you. Keep it going. All right. So you like that CP. Uh, I see a little smile from you here. Wow. Jay Mack. Are you, uh, were you about ducking that smoke or you like what the Knicks yeah. did here? It's, it's funny, you know, CP, you say you go giants. I go jets. <laughs> You play <laughs> to win the game. That's it. A little Herm Edwards. A little back there. I like that. A of- <laughs> like, look, anybody out there who wanted the, the Knicks to, to duck the smoke on, on Sunday and lose and fall to the, what we didn't know at the time, would it be a three or a four seed? You, you should put this team on a 12 step program if you want that because they are addicted to winning, which is not a thing that you would have said about this franchise for most of the last 20 years. Um, they approach every, forget every game, they approach every possession like it is life or death, like it is the last possession that these guys will ever play. And they have specifically constructed a roster full of players, and as you said, the head coach, who approach the game that way. And I think for that reason, that, that is not something you could turn on and off, I, I, I don't think. You either have that instilled in you or you don't. And I think there are a lot of organizations out there in the NBA who, you know, they, it, it, winning is not, you know, a quote another football coach. Winning isn't everything. It's the only thing. That's not the case for, for a lot of teams out there. It is the case for the Knicks. And I think they needed that mentality, to, you know, go back to what I was saying before about perspective, to turn the franchise around from where it was. It took that sort of mentality to get from, from the depths of where they were at to where they're at now. I love it. Um, we'll see how it works out for them, but I love the approach. Yeah, I like it. I think that's a good point about that mentality is actually what got them from where they are to True. where they are now, right? Yeah. Like yeah. that yeah. matters a lot here too. But look, this is a preview. The people are here to get into these matchups. This is what the people want. So let's get into yeah. these matchups between the 76ers and the Heat, which are the Knicks' possible opponents. Start with you on this, Macri. This one is for you both. Who do you think is a more favorable matchup for the Knicks, the 76ers and the Heat? And, and why do you think that's a, it's whatever team is a more favorable matchup? Yeah, I, I know CP is going to talk about the Sixers in a bit, so I won't say too much on them. But uh, this team, the Philadelphia this year, 29-7 and seven when Joel Embiid and Tyrese Maxey are both in the lineup. That is a 66-win pace. Now, if you go look at their schedule, there was some quite a few patsies uh, in, in there, that portion, when they got those wins. But we know what they are. Their net rating says what they are when those guys are both in the lineup. They're a, a, an excellent team. And like I just talked about, the Knicks don't really have a lot of weaknesses. I, I don't think the Sixers have many either. The Heat, I understand, may uh, evoke a lot of you know, worries uh, from m- many members of the fan base, older members who remember the 90s and certainly uh, who remember last season. That said, this is a different Heat team than the one the Knicks lost to um, in the playoffs last year. Last year in the regular season entering the playoffs, the Heat were, I think, the second or third best team in clutch games in terms of net rating. And more than that, they were the seventh best offense in clutch uh, spots in the NBA last season. This season, they are a bottom four offense in clutch moments, and they are a bottom three team overall in terms of clutch net rating. They have had issues uh, in close games all year long. That is how they succeeded last year. I don't believe the same formula is there for them this year. So uh, for me, I would, for as much as it would be tough, I would take my chances against the Heat before the Sixers. All right, taking your chances with the Heat before the Sixers. Where are you on this, CP? Do you want the Sixers or do you want the Heat? As an emotional Knicks fan, I want the Heat. 
I want revenge. I want revenge for Brunson for last year. I want revenge for Julius Randle. I want revenge for Patrick Ewan, Charlie Ward. The whole <laughs> nine. Bring back the rivalry. We need it back. And, you know, I think with the Heat versus the Sixers, it's a it's – a, uh, reputation versus reality, right? The Heat's reputation. Yeah. Will they turn it on in the playoffs? The Spolster factor, playoff Jimmy and the whole nine yards. But as Jonathan said, in reality, they haven't been playing their best basketball. Yeah. They have a number, number of guys recovering from injury. Terry Rozier with the neck. Uh, Duncan Robinson recovering. So it, it's unclear which Heat team is going to show up in the playoffs. And the reality is the Philadelphia 76ers, next to the Knicks, are the hottest team in the Eastern Conference. Yeah. Yeah. They won eight straight. They're getting an MVP. They got an MVP back fresh roughly now he got a little bit hurt dinged up uh, the other night but you get on Joel Embiid back with Tyrese Maxey a ridiculous dynamic duo as Jonathan Macri said a 760 win percentage when those yeah. two guys are on the court they have depth Buddy Heald shooting the ball well as of late Kelly Oubre an erratic player has asserted himself as a legit number three candidate next to those two yeah. guys and so they have leadership with Kyle Lowry an extension of Nick Nurse on the court and as I just mentioned Nick Nurse he's not Doc Rivers <laughs> so they have, I believe, a Shots coaching. Shot. Shots fired. Hey, Doc, Doc once, once a Nick, always Nick. He, he can come back <laughs> Poor to the Doc cookout. Poor Doc catching shrapnel from the SNY Doc, sticky Doc, we love you, man. You can always come to the cookout. But I think that can change things for the Sixers. Right. Just in terms of the adjustments that Nick's nurse might throw out there. Maybe he throws some wild cards there. Hmm. Philadelphia, a deep team. They can handle the Knicks in terms of being physical, in terms of playing big. And so I think they're a more dangerous matchup than the Miami Heat right now. All right, so there you go. So both you guys think the Heat are a better matchup for the Knicks in the first round. But we got to look at both teams. And so I'm going to start with you on this, CP, because you just talked about the, their Atlantic Division rivals, the Philadelphia 76ers. They could see them here in the first round if they win that 7-8 game. But the thing you guys both talked about, how good the team has been with Tyrese Maxey yeah. and Joel Embiid. So my question to you, CP, is, all right, how should the Knicks handle those stars defensively? You can't stop them. Yeah. But how do you slow them down defensively? Especially for Embiid. He's a guy with relatively little weaknesses. And if there is one, maybe it's his conditioning and his durability. And so for the Knicks, will it be opportunities to play fast? I would look at a two-man game between Isaiah Hartenstein and Jalen Brunson as being fairly key. Can they, bring Jaylen, can they bring Joel Embiid away from the basket? Maybe a bit more high pick and rolls, utilizing Isaiah Hartenstein as a playmaker as well to test Joel Embiid out there on the perimeter and on the end on the wings defensively it's going to be all hands on deck you're going to need a disciplined game from isaiah hartenstein you throw mitchell robinson out there presses achua may get dominated a little bit but he's going to have to get some minutes if those two guys pick up get into foul trouble and then limiting those guys in terms of second chance opportunities part of your defense is being able to rebound and that's why i say josh hart is going to be key there hartenstein mitch keeping philadelphia off the glass to limit them to just one possession from a maxi standpoint, testing his ability. This is going to be his chance on the playoff stage as being the guy. Yeah. Last year, he was number three to Harden and Embiid. Now, he's going to have to make those guys better. Obviously, in the two-man game with Embiid, they'll be dangerous. OG Ananobi, he will be the wild card. When he's guarded Tyrese Maxey, he's limited his effectiveness. And so it's going to be multiple bodies that the Knicks are going to have to throw at these guys, but it's all hands on deck. All hands on deck to get it done if the Knicks play the Sixers. Now, you guys talked about this both with the Heat. Look, I think a lot of Knicks fans are going to be with you. They want mm. some revenge for last year. You said you want a revenge from back yeah, in 97. Everybody, everybody. You, were going, you were going way back yeah. with this. Yeah. J-Mac, for you, if the Heat win on Wednesday, right, the Knicks would face them. Obviously, it's going to be a rematch of last year's second-round playoff series. We saw the Heat in the last regular season game. We saw them blitz Jalen Brunson yeah. a lot. They were pretty aggressive against them defensively. How can the Knicks counter Miami's defensive schemes if they see them this time in the postseason? Uh, I think the Heat, needless to say, they're so well coached. You know, Eric Spolstra, we saw it last year. Um, his teams, even when they are not the strongest versions of themselves, right, uh, they do as good a job as anybody in the league at identifying what you want to do and taking that away. And so they know, obviously, that everything goes off of Jalen Brunson. So they have this unique ability in terms, of their, in terms of their positioning, in terms of obviously who they put out there on the floor, of where it seems like sometimes you're facing them, there's like six defenders on the yeah, court, yep, right? Yep. You know, arms and yep. all the passing lanes, and they're, they're not doubling, but they're not like giving you all the room in the world. So what it does is it makes you think. It makes Jalen Brunson take that extra sec. Okay, well, where, where's the help coming from? And there's some hard doubles, I agree with you, where, you know, and I think he, Brunson obviously 
needs to be able to read the floor. I think he's done, by and large, an outstanding job of that throughout the season. I'm not worried about Jalen Brunson. I'm not, not saying I'm worried about these guys I'm about to bring up, but it's on the guy who gets the pass from Brunson whether that's Isaiah Hardenstein, and you talked about him before, CP, and I'm happy you did, Josh Hart. Look, Josh Hart may not always be the most willing shooter, but the one thing that you know when Josh Hart's going right that he's doing is making quick decisions. So yeah. if, he's, if he's not comfortable with his jump shot, um, I'll use a term my colleague DJ Zulo uses all the time, stampede the catch. Catch the mm -hmm. ball. If you're not shooting it, that's okay. Bum rush the defense. Get the next domino to fall down. And, and if it's a, a shot at the rim, it's a shot at the rim, although it's an outlet. Um, whatever the case may be, those guys have to be on point, those two in particular. And then as far as DiVincenzo, who we talked about before, and Deuce McBride, who's been a godsend for this team. He's going to play real minutes in the playoffs. If those guys have an open shot, and I'm talking more about Deuce than Dante, because Dante's fire, firing when ready all the time. Deuce has done a great job of that this year. He needs to continue to do it without hesitation in the playoffs, because if you have a shot and you don't take it against his team, um, it's death because they're just going to reset and you're going to uh, probably get not a great possession out of it. And we saw some of the hesitation for the Knicks players in last year's series. Yes. Josh Hart in yeah. particular, maybe not wanting to take those shots and, and take that. You can't have that here. To your point, Josh Hart, really good when he gets the ball in four and three situations and making some of those quick decisions. So we'll see how that goes. Now, CP, Knicks fans have been talking about this. You know they want this. They want to see this team make a deep playoff run. For a lot of people, that would probably be we consider the Eastern Conference Finals. Yeah. Um, but when you look at this Knicks team, and we know the Boston Celtics are the favorite to win the conference, the question is, and we'll try to be realistic. Yeah. I know you guys are realistic <laughs> in terms of this. Can the Knicks, as currently constructed, compete with the Celtics for the Eastern Conference title. I think they can compete with anybody, honestly, because yeah. of their floor being a tough physical defensive team and being able to rebound with the clutch factor of Jalen Brunson. I give the Knicks a chance against anybody. Boston is going to have to pass this test. We talked about it before this show. Yes, they've been historic in terms of their net rating and point differential, but who's going to close for that team? Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, they still have to exercise those demons, and I, I still think they can be had. Also, the Boston depth will be tested. Yes, Peyton Pritchett has played well, and Sam Hauser shoots the cover off the ball. His range is unlimited. <laughs> yeah. But I still think they have some question marks there. Al Horford's durability, is he starting to, to wear mm -hmm. down? You know, I've always thought each year, like, he's going to be watched. He's going to be watched. But he steps up for them. Kristaps Porzingis, for me, is going to be, obviously, the, the guy that swings things uh, for, for the Celtics. His ability to stretch the floor, play off of those two stars in the pick-and-roll, pick-and-pop situations. If they can get that play from Kristaps, they're going to be dangerous. But as I said, I, I give the Knicks a, a great chance against the Boston Celtics. All right, you like it. like that they can compete yeah. against the Celtics. J-Mac, I'm going to ask you this because we talked about Eric Spolstra on the side mm -hmm. of the heat. And anytime you talk about the playoffs, we're going to talk about coaching. And the coaching of Tom Thibodeau, you're smiling here. You know this. It's always been an interesting topic among Knicks fans. Knicks fans know this. So i got to ask you this, J-Mac. What adjustments does Tibbs need to make in this postseason to make a deep run in the playoffs so they can compete with the Celtics like we just talked about with CP? I'm, I'm happy you asked me this question, Dexter, because... Oh, I, oh it was for you. This one, was, this one had to be for you. I, you knew it was coming. Yeah, <laughs> look, I, I've kind of gotten the reputation over the last few years as being the, the Tibbs defender yeah, because I just, I, I don't feel like... <laughs> I don't feel like the guy gets quite, quite enough, of, enough credit. Before, before we talk about adjustments in the playoffs, we, we got to take a step back and look at this year. This guy was, even going back before this year, was lambasted for his treatment of, of Cam Reddish. Cam Reddish is you know, a superstar on the bench. Why are you not yeah. utilizing him? Well, what's, what's Cam doing in L.A. these days? Um, more shots fired at people on the team. True. I like it. It's I mean, true, just we, we call it like it is. Yeah. He got killed for sticking with, with Josh Hart uh, because Josh Hart, as we talked about, hesitant shooters sometimes. Who's been the life and, and, and lifeblood and heart and soul of this team now for months since they sustained these injuries? Josh Hart. Um, they're always killed consistently, Tibbs is, for having an offense that is unimaginative, uncreative. He's a dinosaur. It's from the 90s, this and that. They lost an all-NBA-level player in Julius Randle this year, and on the fly, Tom Thibodeau rejiggered their offense, centered it around more movement, ball movement, player movement, um, cutting, uh, dribble handoffs, all the sorts of things that we've been seeing from them. And forget keeping them afloat. It got them to 50 wins. So the notion that this coach is not able to, to make adjustments, 
I'm sorry, the facts simply don't bear that out. In terms of what I want to see in the playoffs, or what I'm, like, I'll put to you, what I'm curious about in the playoffs, one name I don't know that we've said too much yet on this preview was Mitchell Robinson. Mm, yeah. And Mitch has been back for a few weeks now. Um, hasn't quite looked like himself, right? Yeah, I think yeah. we could agree hasn't quite looked like himself. If they are in a series, and I'm going to go even a step further, if they're specifically in a series against the Heat, which Mitchell Robinson has struggled against Miami, certainly struggled. He, he was a different player than he was against Cleveland when they faced the Heat last year. And he's struggling, and he's not able to really wreak havoc on the offensive boards. Does Tibbs go to Precious, who we saw come up big in, uh, against the Bulls in the season finale? He's been there anytime he's been called upon. A former Heat player. So you want to talk about a guy who knows a little bit. I mean, I was, he was only there for one year, but still, knows a little bit about what goes on there. Um, gives you a, a little bit more versatility. Not the ceiling that Mitch has in terms of offensive rebounding, certainly in terms of pick and roll coverage. But against Miami, I wonder if, if Precious wouldn't be a, a, a more tenable matchup if, yeah. if Mitch is, is not himself. I agree. Yeah, so you would like that. Sentence. Go ahead. Yeah. You got something uh, you want uh, to say? To, to yeah. add on Tibbs, I think this year you could argue that this is the best job he's done since maybe taking that, that 2013 Bulls team with Nate Robinson. In, in, into the playoffs, and, and he's he's dispelled a lot of myths. Uh, the minutes police dispel that. that he doesn't run plays. I mean, take a look at how these guys break down film every single game. They run several actions, new actions that you haven't yeah. even seen last year. How they run Jalen Brunson off ball in terms of in in terms of how they compensate for the loss of Julius Randle. Unlimited range. Dante Divincenzo green light from anywhere. Quickly had the same thing, and so. You know, Tibbs has shown that he's willing to adapt to the modern NBA. Yes, he still has his, you know, his his core that certain coaches have, and maybe he's not doesn't take as many risks as, as other coaches. But Tom Thibodeau's done a phenomenal job, second in the East. He's not going to be a coach of the year. That's probably going to go to Mark Diagno of the yeah. Thunder, but he deserves a lot of votes. No, he definitely deserves a lot of mo- yeah. votes. Jamal Mosley also with the yes. Magic will yeah. we'll get some consideration That's- too. I, I wanted to bring that up, and I'm glad you guys talked about that because I think, and as you guys have talked about in your programs that you do, there has been a lot of talk about Tibbs. And I've had people come on here with me and be like, oh, Tibbs needs to do this, Tibbs needs to do that. Yeah. I'm glad to hear you guys give him credit, not to defend him in this way, but we got to call things as they are, right? we got to call a spade a spade. He's done a good job. The stuff about him not playing young players, absolutely not true. <laughs> Look at Miles McBride. Right, we've right. talked about. There's other players you could turn. I remember all the Knicks fans that were worried about Obi Toppin. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Remember, remember that just this past offseason? Not the case. Knicks are doing Knicks are doing okay with that back and forth spot. I know absolutely. we talked about that a little bit before yeah. the season, but doing fine. Okay, last thing for you guys, because I want to get your perspective on this. When you talk about a successful playoff run, that can mean different things to different people. So two-part question for both of you. What would a successful playoff run this postseason look like to you? And then also, what do you think that would mean, however it looks like to you, to the key players on this team and the franchise as a whole? Start with you, J-Man. Uh, I'm going to choose my words carefully here because I don't, I don't want to be accused of having a, a, a loser's mentality. Um, no, no, no. You weren't running from the smoke, so we can't call you. A, you don't have yeah. a loser's mentality. We won't put that on you. No, but like, here's what I'm going to say. If this team goes out there and they perform like they've performed with the same effort that they've performed with over the last since Julius went down, I mean we go further than that, but that's really the portion of the season that I think has gotten so many of us really behind this team and believing them, believing them, and really genuinely loving them um, in a way that I, I don't know that we've really latched onto another team at least in my lifetime. Uh, if they go out there and do that, I will have a tough time calling the season a failure, whether it results in a first-round playoff exit, a second-round playoff exit, a tough seven-game series against the Boston Celtics in which, you know, we're right there at the finish line, can't quite get it done. Because every time that they are down, every time when it seems like they should be counted out, they continue to answer the bell. They are never out of any game. How many times are they down by double digits, uh, 15 points, 20 points, and yet, right there in the fourth quarter, inevitably, they're going to make it a game. Um, it is a team, you know, again, there's one shot creator on this team, Jalen Brunson, legitimate shot creator. Historically, those, two, those sorts of teams have trouble going far in the playoffs. This, this team is going to try to overcome um, that, that, you know, historical precedent. As far as what it would mean if they do, Dexter, if they could make it to a conference finals, after having lost, and CP, you said it perfectly earlier, with all of the things that they've had to go through this year. 
if they can make it to a conference finals, I, I don't see how you don't look at them as the team to watch in the NBA over the next five years. Jalen Brunson is 27 years old. They, the, the la, uh, I was thinking about it this way. They, they, won, uh, they had a second seed back in, uh, in 2013. The time before that they had a second seed was back in uh, the 92-93 season. There are two players on this roster that were alive in 92-93. <laughs> this whole group is young. They have all, of, as we always talk about, they have all of their draft picks. They could make moves. And if they could do, uh, have a serious run with this roster... I, I mean, it, it would be a real, real feather in the cap, I think, for everybody involved. Yeah, you were talking before we started recording about how the window in the NBA can sometimes be really short. might not be as long as you think, and you want to capitalize on the opportunities you have. But you also, I think as fans, you want to try to enjoy the moment as much as you can. Yeah. yeah. CP, what's your vision or what's your definition of a successful playoff run for the Knicks this postseason? What do you think that would mean for the franchise? Well, if they make it to the Eastern Conference Finals, all bets are off. I mean, it's going to be a holiday in New York. I mean, <laughs> the city's going to be absolutely yeah. shut down just based on the, the fans' enthusiasm. But as a two seed, I want to see this team get past the first round. I, I think getting past the first round for me is a success, given all of the circumstances that they had to face this season. Uh, you know, Jalen Brunson playing at a high level, and I said as their floor, being a good defensive team, a good rebounding team, physical, like they have the makings of a good playoff team. Can they make a good run? As Macri said, they're going to be limited because mm -hmm. I do think they're going to struggle at times to finding consistent offense. It's going to put a lot of pressure. We know Brunson's going to be there, but DiVincenzo, what's, this is his big stage as a starter mm -hmm. in the playoffs. It's key, uh, teams are going to key in on him when they run him off the three-point line. What is he going to do? How is he going to create for others? As Macri said, it's about that second pass. Uh, Josh Hart, pressure. Boyan Bogdanovich, pressure. Deuce McBride has to knock down those shots. It's going to take a lot for this team to make it far uh, in the playoffs. So I think if they can get past the first round, this has been a, a huge success for this team. And go back to the trade deadline. They could have put more chips in the table. Yeah. They had the, the cash aid again. Anybody that they wanted, they're sticking to a vision. They're sticking to their game plan. And so what it's going to mean if they get past the first round, it means that they're on their way. They are legit. The books look clean. Their draft capital looks clean. Two draft picks coming up in the draft. Yeah. Will they trade some? Will they try to find some you know, upperclassmen depth? They are on their way. But the key word here is legit. This is mm. not scraping to get to the eighth seed. This is not a 50-win Knicks tape team with a bunch of veterans and Carmelo Anthony. That was not sustainable. This team has sustainability with Jalen Brunson and Tom Thibodeau as their two-man ticket. Now, we'll see what OG's contract looks like. What will they do with Julius Randle? But I think this team is on their way regardless, man. So the word I like there and the word I think Knicks fans really like is sustainability. Yeah. Before the start of the year, we talked a lot about continuity. Mm. Now we're on to sustainability. Yeah. So it's going to be very interesting for Knicks fans as they move forward in this. This has been fun, guys. Always. As always. This always, is, man. This is always fun to have you here. I'm, I'm glad you guys were such a big part of this show in the first season we did it. Wow. Previewing before the middle of the season. Now for the postseason, and you know you guys will be back. We'll have to do yeah, something, whether yeah, it's for the yeah. draft or the offseason, because that's going to be a fun time. But before we get there, we still got a lot to enjoy with the Knicks. We don't know who they're going to play yet. We'll find that on Wednesday, whether it's going to be the Heat or the Sixers. Got some more stuff coming up. But, guys, I want everybody to check out the work, support these guys. CP, the franchise, Knicks Fan TV. My guy, Jonathan Macri, the dean of Knicks Film School. Please check them out. Support them. They do such great work. You know, I love you guys. I love what you do for the Knicks community. Likewise. And also yeah. being... Yeah. No, nah, well, well, thank you. Seriously, having us in here, this, is a big, uh, this will never not be a big deal yeah. to me. Yeah. Coming in yeah. here and... and you know, and you know what? Doing. I got to say this. So people know this. Because when these two guys come up here, and they've known me for a little bit, and they come yeah. up here, it's always love. But you guys yeah. always have that same energy and excitement and just love to be here. And that shows you in the know. content you do. And that's why you guys do such great content and you're doing such great stuff for the fans. So I want to salute you guys and... I always like giving people their flowers. Appreciate it, man. Appreciate it. I'll take them. Yeah. yeah, you guys are going to have a, hopefully, a busy couple of Absolutely, weeks. Absolutely. You know, let's say a couple of months. I was about yeah. to say. Yeah. We want yeah. a couple of months. Uh, we're more June. than weeks. June. We want to get to June. Take us to the summer, man. Hey, it's been a long time since we talked some Knicks in June. Right, right guys? In a positive way. Right? It's, yeah. been, it's been a while since we've done that. So hopefully, we're able to do that. Thank you guys for coming. And appreciate you. We'll do this again soon. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, those are my guys. Check them out. The Knicks are on fire. Well, since we are in playoff mode, we've got more content coming for the Knicks fans this week. On Thursday, April 18th, 
we will be bringing you a special New York Got Game live playoff preview show where we'll know the matchup for the New York Knicks, whether they are playing the Miami Heat or the Philadelphia 76ers. And New York Post Knicks beat writer Stefan Bondi will be joining me to preview who the Knicks will be playing in that first round matchup and how that all will go down. That'll be at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. We also will be taking questions from fans about the matchup and the Knicks in the postseason in general. And we also might have some other special guests, so stay tuned for more details. Thanks again to my amazing guests, CP the Franchise and Jonathan Macri. As always, thank you to the people who make this show, the best basketball show in the Big Apple possible. My producers, Brian Wachowski and Emma Kate Austin, editor Catherine Cooper, and director Chris Famularo. I'm Dexter Henry. We'll see you next time on New York Got Game. And thanks for watching New York Got Game. Boom shakalaka.